My uncle had an eye laser. Oh no, lazy eye. That was it. I knew it was something like that. How do Filbert? I, I brought 20 quid with me anyway. How do Filbert? We don't give a damn how much money you brought with you. What do you want? I, I, I'd like to talk about independent education. Please. Right, well, send us after 20 quid and you can. How do Tony? Susie and Sweet Brand of Chris and Smith. Folk Club. Ugh, too young, Tony. Go to bed. Hello, Philip. I'm going to dig up some rusty memories for you, Alan. We're going to go back in time to 1960, where the best television shows on were Dragnet with a fella called da -da -da -da. Jack Friday. Da -da -da -da. And Emergency Ward 10. And Dr. Kildare with... Um, Richard Chamberlain. Richard Chamberlain. But I liked Emergency Ward 10 better, because the people didn't stop... didn't keep stopping in that. Oh, I see. A small bottle of lemonade costs sixpence. Did it? A quarter sweets cost under a shilling. Well, I get them for now, now, so I'm, I'm doing well. Daughter. Inflation's going down. Also, a bag of crisps costs under a shilling. And, uh How much is a shilling? A shilling? Well, it's 5p, isn't it? I don't know. I asked you. Well, it's 5p. Oh. And, uh in 1962, there was a number one called Not... Nut Rocker. Who's it by, Alan? B. Bumble and the Stingers or somebody like that. Yeah, nice one. And in 1968, Fire. Who's that by? Fire? I am the god of hell, Fire! Um, was, was it Jimmy James and the Vagabonds? No, no. Ron, it was uh, The Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Arthur Brown, that's it, eh? And it was a good record. That's it. And the most fantastic one you end this thing about 1960s... Was you were born. Nope. Oh. Was Mars bars were wrapped in paper like a parcel. And they had exactly the same design on they got now, except they had more caramel on top and less nougat on the bottom. Yeah. They had cost six They were great. Oh, then were the days. Then were the days. Right. How do you know all this? Uh, I've been researching. You're of tender years, I describe. Yeah, that was before my time. Indeed it was. Yeah, that brings back some good memories. It brings back memories of of the greatest ill... And I was going out with Pamela Majerison. Oh. Uh, and she and one or two others. And Glenda Potter, their next-door neighbour. I hope they never found out for yeah. each other, but never mind. That was life. All right. All right, bye. ta -ra. And also, I had trouble growing a beard. Mind you, I didn't try, cos, well, I only had bum fluff, and it wasn't on me bum. I, I didn't have anything on me bum at the time, except perhaps a pair of underpants. They were Y fronts. Still, never mind. Thank you for all those romantic memories, Philip. No doubt your grandfather told you about them. Eric will be with you after the 11 o'clock news, providing, of course, you stay on the line. If you don't, we won't, but there's somebody else there. I hope. Eleven o'clock news, this is Alan King. America looks set to attack Libya again. President Reagan says Colonel Gaddafi is a definite suspect in two recent terrorist strikes against U.S. targets in Europe, and he's vowing that America will retaliate. Two U.S. warships are on the alert in the Mediterranean, but the Libyan leader is warning that Russia won't stand by with its hands tied if America renews military attacks. From Washington, Andrew Mandelstam. Two U.S. aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean were given new orders. The carrier Coral Sea was told to turn around and postpone plans to return home. The carrier America cancelled the visit to Cannes and headed out to sea. The U.S. fleet in the region presently numbers two battle groups totaling 20 ships. The new orders were issued as President Reagan warned that the U.S. wouldn't, in his words, just sit and hold still in the aftermath of the TWA bombing and the attack on a West Berlin nightclub. Mr. Reagan has planned a news conference for later tonight. Andrew Mandelstam, IRN, Washington. Marathon talks aimed at heading off a nationwide strike by prison officers have broken down within the last half hour. As Dave Loyne reports, there now looks little hope of more negotiations. The Home Office say the dispute is over who runs the prisons. They won't let the prison officers determine manning levels. But the Prison Officers Association say they have a right to negotiate as tight cash limits hit the service. They say some of Britain's jails are in a dangerous state and the whole system is close to chaos. After 12 hours, the two sides are no nearer a solution. The prison officers were balloted on industrial action today. If the vote is yes, they could cripple the system in only three weeks by refusing to admit new prisoners. 
British Airways boss Lord King is dismissing reports that he was one of two peers who offered helicopter tycoon Alan Bristow a knighthood during the Westland affair. He says it's ridiculous. Mr Bristow, a majority shareholder in Westland, claimed that the offer was made as a bribe to persuade him to drop support for a takeover of the ailing firm by a European consortium. Mr Bristow has allegedly named Lord King and another peer in a confidential letter to the Speaker of the House of Commons. It was revealed yesterday that the Director of Public Prosecutions is investigating the case. A former Hull vicar has tonight been charged with indecency offences. The 53-year-old father of three will appear in court tomorrow, as David Golly reports. The Reverend Jan Noss was arrested by detectives this afternoon when the Director of Public Prosecutions decided there was enough evidence to bring a case against him. After being questioned for nearly six hours, he's been charged with offences of indecency and will appear before magistrates in the morning. The Reverend Noss was vicar of a whole parish for nearly four years, but has just retired on health grounds. David Golly, IRN, Hull. The government's facing a major backbench revolt over Mrs Thatcher's controversial bill to scrap res restrictions on Sunday trading. Following a meeting of Tory rebels tonight, about 80 Conservatives will defy party orders and either vote against or abstain when the bill's debated next Monday. The backbenchers are furious, saying ministers have refused to make concessions to meet objections to the bill. Independent Radio News. If you dare. Alan Benzik, the late night show. And the number, of course, is Preston 561000. Red Rose Stadium. How do you, Eric? No, Eric. Never mind. We shall talk instead with somebody else on line six, whose name we shall find out in a moment. We don't know whose name it is, in fact. Alice is pressing the wrong button. <laughs> I'll do. Oh, it's all noise anyway. We won't bother with that. Line seven, Bina. Who? Bina, Dina, Tina. No. Nabina. Nabila. Nabila. I'll do. Right. Um, there was a film on ITV last Monday. Um, an officer and a gentleman. It had Richard Gere in it. And um, there was a song at end of there that went something like, let love lift us up where we belong. I was wondering if you knew who it were by. Phil Collins. It isn't. It is. It doesn't sound like him. Oh, Phil Collins. It isn't. No, it isn't. No, it's the other one. Hang on. No, he was against all odds. That was also in it, wasn't it? It's a duet, is it? Yeah, hang on. I'll bring you up where we belong. Oh, I can't remember now. It's a man and a woman, in it? Yeah, I think it's George Summer and Jennifer Summer. George Benson? No, it's not no. Benson. It don't sound out like George it. George McRae? I don't know. Hey, I ought to know that because I play it quite often on this programme. I'm not very good at pop music. No, Phil Collins did the other one, Against All Odds, so it's not him. Yeah. But someone will come on and tell us. I've forgotten who, actually. Okay, I didn't know. right, thanks. All right, so right, don't go right, away. Someone right, will bye. tell us. Tara. How do, Alan? <laughs> They've all disappeared. You see, they get fed up of waiting whilst we're on the news. The man's coming or something. How do, Mark? Good evening, Mr Bessick. Um, I'd like to talk about the situation in the Middle East concerning President Reagan and Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, I think America should go ahead and invade Libya. Uh, what's your opinion on the situation? Why do you think America should go ahead and invade Libya? Because about time someone put an end to Gaddafi's reign of terrorism. Do you um, actually think that would put an end to it? Yes, I do, if Libya was... if, if uh, Gaddafi's regime was, was stopped. Certainly it would. There's no other way. Well, we, well, well, just a moment. There's no other way isn't a statement of any value at all. Why do you think it would stop it? Because if Gaddafi isn't there, none, none, none of his uh, uh, regime is, st is still uh, uh, being implemented, then how can, how can it go on? The same way as it has gone on in many other countries where terrorism has been, if you like, the doctrine. <laughs> Let us take Northern Ireland. Terrorism takes place there. It doesn't matter what you do, it takes place. Let us take uh, Lebanon. There's about five different armies taken over Lebanon, but still the terrorism continues. Terrorism is virtually impossible to stamp out. There is no forceful solution to terrorism, because for every terrorist you kill, you create a martyr amongst his people. And amongst those people, 
you will create further terrorists, no matter how many you deal with. So you the think... Germans found that out in the war. Let's face it, in the eyes of the Nazis, the French resistance were terrorists, correct? Yes. Yeah. By definition. I mean, I don't think they were, but by definition they were. And they were successful throughout the whole of the war, throughout the whole of the German occupation of France. The French resistance successfully caused mayhem for the well, German still... army. So you cannot stop it. It doesn't matter how forceful a rule you have over a nation, you cannot stop terrorism. There was no one to put an end to a French resistance, though. The Nazis were quite good at putting an end to things. Well, they're too busy being fought. Uh, they're fighting a different If you war. were going to talk stupid, Mark, then talk to somebody else. If you can give me one example, just I will settle for one, where physical force, military force, has eliminated terrorism, I will concede that you have won. Just give me one example. Um... Just one, Mark. Not ten, not a thousand, when, just when, one. When Mussolini invaded... Uh, Is this the Mussolini that was held upside down yes, in the streets of Italy and kicked to death? No, he was shot first. Shot first. That's the Mussolini that put out terrorism. No, the one I, I that was killed. If you'd let me finish. I well, ju what I want to know, Mark, I want one example where physical force has eradicated terrorism. I was just about to tell you. You weren't. Mussolini died. I know. I'm not talking about him. It, can I just finish my sentence, please? Feel free. You? When Mussolini invaded Corfu... Go on. Um, the League of Nations drove him out. The League of Nations drove who out? Uh, drove the Italian forces out. And were they terrorists? They were invaders. I asked you to give me an example where an invasion, where physical military force has eliminated terrorism. That's what I asked for. Will you kindly give me one? Um, I'm sure there is one. I can't think off the top of my head. There isn't one, Mark. That's why. There is not one. Because the human spirit is actually more powerful so do you in motivation than in fear. So, do you think that it's best that all the um, governments of the world sit back and let Gaddafi kill hundreds of innocent people? The answer to that question is no, I do not think it is best for those governments to sit what back. Do, what do you think is best, then? The only solution to terrorism can only ever be a political solution. Oh, you, now, no. some, of the, some of the terrorism perpetrated in this world is blamed on Gaff Gaddafi and in actual fact isn't caused by him, isn't ordered by him at all. That's true, but when you've got someone like Colonel Gaddafi, they, there's no way anyone can compromise with him. What is it he is asking for? Gaddafi is um, asking for, for um, well, he, he, along with the, with the other Arab states, he's asking for the Israelis to leave Israel and um, for, for Israel to... Well, is he asking for that? It seems to me, Mark, that you are somewhat poorly informed. Well, what is it he's, uh, he's after that? He's actually asking for the creation of a Palestinian state. Well, that's, that's what I mean. The Israelis being driven out and... No, and that is not what he's asking for. It may well be necessary for the Israelis to be moved out of a part of what they claim to be Israel to Which create is Israel. a Palestinian state. Well, you can say it is Israel if you like, but it's only been Israel for 40-odd years and it was created by Does a government... Matter? It was created by a government that was nothing to do with Israel. So were uh, so, uh, dozens and dozens of other countries. Indeed, but the only solution to that problem is to actually create a Palestinian state. There is no other solution. As long as there is no Palestinian state, the Palestinian people who feel that there should be will be prepared to commit murder for that belief. Now, I am not justifying their modus operandi. I am not justifying even their cause. I am simply saying that their cause will not diminish. Their desire to kill or be killed for that cause will not go away. Indeed, if we thought it would, we would be calling them cowards. If we thought the presence of the German army in France would have done away with the French resistance, we'd have considered the French people to be cowardly because we believed in their cause. You see, one man's terrorist is another man's resistance fighter and freedom fighter. 
And that's why you can't get rid of it, because they are only terrorists by definition of an individual. They are not terrorists in any other way. Mm. But you say that, um, you, you, before you, you said that an invasion has, nev has never um, solved terrorism. It has well, never eradicated terrorism. Well, I, I, I agree at, at the moment, if I think of an example, I'm sure there is one. But don't you think it, it's time for, for the first time? Don't well, you think the first time would work? The answer to that is, if it would work, it might be. But I can never approve of one sovereign state invading another sovereign state. You'd rather innocent people got slaughtered, you wouldn't... Do you... well, just a moment. Do you actually think, bombing Israel, only the troops will die? Or do you think... Uh, sorry, bombing... <laughs> I've forgotten his country. Gaddafi's country, and Libya. Libya. Do you think if, if the American jets flew off their aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean and bombed Libya, they have some kind of new bomb that only kills militia? No, but... No, they will kill innocent Libyans. I know. I'm or are you maintaining no, there's no such thing as an in I innocent Libyan? I understand. I understand there, there are countless uh, innocent Libyans. So, know. Mark, you're prepared to put those Ill innocent Libyans to death, well, you, are you? You quoted Israel before Israel... Well, then. that was a mistake. Would, would you like to tell me, are you prepared to have those innocent Libyans put to death to protect innocent lives? Uh, in a situation like this, I think a number of... Would you like to answer the question, Mark? I know you hate yeah, yourself. Uh, in, in, in a, so your yeah. statement that, is that the only way to save innocent lives, is to actually take more innocent lives. That's how you do it. In this situation, yes. Then you're an idiot. And you're an even bigger idiot, aren't Yes, I am. Yes. But I get paid for being one, and you have no excuse whatsoever. For the lady that rang earlier, Joe Cocker and Jennifer Beale, I am told, sang the theme tune to an officer and a gentleman. How do Ivan? Call a chicken in. How do Kath? How do Andrew? Hello, oh, Alan. Yes? Uh, a few nights ago, you said that uh, uh, private health reduces the waiting lists on the National Health Service. Why are you telling me this? Well, I'd like to disagree with you on that point, because if the doctors that work for the National Health Service weren't uh, greedy and were working on their uh, out of hours... Well, just a moment. Are patients? you suggesting, Andrew, that if there were not private patients, the doctors who currently indulge in private practice would all work 40 hours a week or 60 hours a week for the National Health Service? No, I'm not saying that. No, all, so you... People so getting to work the longer hours. Not unless they were paid for it. But they are paid for it. Really well, they're only pay, they're paid for a service, and they provide that service to the National Health... Yeah, but do you think it's right that they go out of the way and work minimum hours... Just Andrew, the question, is it right, is irrelevant. You're challenging my statement that it reduces the waiting list. That is all I said. I didn't say that was a good thing or a bad thing, it was an arguing point. I said the existence of private hospitals reduces the waiting list. That is a statistical fact. If you wish to challenge it, go ahead, but so far you've failed to do so successfully. Well, I'd like to say then that, uh Well, would you like to challenge the statement? That was what you came on to do? Do so. Well, I accept that they... So you cannot challenge the statement now? You do accept what? that the existence of private medicine reduces the waiting list? In a res yeah, in a respect. Good. I don't know why you bother drinking. I'll do Stephen. 24 hours a day, Red Rose Radio. Are you getting the best price for your scrap metals? Filed metal processors are specialists in work clearance. And as consumers of aluminium scrap feel sure they can offer the best prices in Lancashire. Also, cash buyers of copper, lead, brass, old car batteries, and all other non-ferrous grades. Contact Filed Metal Processors on Blackpool 64602. That's 64602. Looking at Leo's Carpets for a beautiful new look in 86. We have the very best selection of carpets, including a lion size range of wool carpets. We guarantee quality workmanship and fitting, free measuring and estimating. And as our choice is so good, if you can't find the carpet for you at Leo's, we don't think you'll find one anywhere. Leo's Carpets, open six days and late night Thursday. Leo's Carpets, Leo's Carpets. Great value, too, at Cherry Tree Blackburn. The Grand 
The Stage Play Cabaret starts Tuesday the 22nd of April until Saturday the 3rd of May. This internationally renowned production stars Wayne Sleep as the Master of Ceremonies. Performances at the Blackpool Grand Theatre nightly at 7.30 with matinees on Wednesday and Saturday at 2.30. Cabaret, the story of a love affair, is rich in musical numbers and decadent performances as found in the nightclubs in Berlin in the 30s. At the same time, the main characters play out the various dramas and traumas of their own personal lives. The the show includes well-known classics like Maybe This Time, Cabaret and Money Money. Booking now at the Grand Theatre box office. Telephone Blackpool 28372. That's Blackpool 28372. It's the great Red Rose Radio Cabaret Night Out. On Thursday the 17th of April at 7pm, our coaches will be leaving Lancaster, Blackpool, Blackburn and Preston, bound for the Wirral's most sophisticated nightclub, the Ritz Cabaret Club. On arriving at the Ritz, you'll be served with a superb basket meal, and then you'll be able to enjoy the voice of international singing star Tony Christie, plus supporting artist comedian Eddie Flanagan. The one and only Wobbly Warren will be there to greet you, and will ensure your evening goes with a bang. The fully inclusive price, including the return coach trip, is just £12 per head. So reserve your place now by calling us on Preston 556301. Don't forget the date, April the 17th, for the great Red Rose Radio Cabaret Night Out. How do you, Mike? Hello, I've got an impression for you. Are we going to play musical chairs now? Do you know that game? Your music starts, and when it stops, everybody has to sit on one of these chairs. Trouble is, though, there aren't enough... That's a recording. Goodbye. How do you, Daniel? Hello, Owen. I want to talk about religious education in schools. Go on. I think it's very, very wrong that people with religious views should be able to teach at the estate's expense those views to children who aren't old enough to differentiate them from fact. Well, first of all, the teaching of religion in school isn't absolutely compulsory, although technically there's a law that says we have to have a period of religious celebration when the whole school must come together, ideally in a morning. So there's no rule and regulation that says religion has to be taught. But are you suggesting that you're against the teaching of religion, or are you against, if you like, the indoctrination of a particular religion? The indoctrination of a particular religion. Yeah. But I think there is legislation that uh, says, in effect, that you have to give half an hour's religious education per week. I don't think that's accurate. School. I don't think that's accurate. Well, I, I wouldn't argue about it. I'm not yeah, but no, I mean, it's just I was listening to a, a radio programme a few days ago, in actual fact. I seem to remember it was on Sunday, on Radio 4, all about it. And they were talking about the assembly, which is the only religious requirement levelled on an education authority, as far as I'm aware. However, that is immaterial. Why is it wrong for a teacher to explain his or her religious beliefs to his or her class? Because at the age that people are at school, I don't think they're able to make critical judgments and differentiate what the teachers uh, explain to them as conjecture. But is the, purpose, is the purpose of teaching a child a today purpose or a tomorrow purpose? A tomorrow purpose. So the fact that the child at that moment isn't able to articulate and, if you like, I suppose, think out the process of religion, think out the opinions of the teacher, it isn't going to indoctrinate them for their whole life. I, for example, went to a Roman Catholic infant and junior schools. I think I went to it. Yes, I did. Sure I did. Yes. So I went to a Roman Catholic infant and junior schools, and yes, I received the indoctrination that all other pupils at that school received, but I am no longer forced to believe them. But didn't you find it a very, very difficult experience to reject those beliefs? Well, I don't actually reject them in the sense of, poo, you know, they're wrong. Mm. Yes, it was a difficult process. Yes, it was a complicated thought process, not a painful one, but a complicated thought process to come to terms with my particular vision of what God is or isn't. But I think that would be the same for any 
body who actually wanted to reasonably think about it, to think about it in a constructive, sensible way, rather than just follow their, their religious pattern. Well, I think the majority of people actually opt out of that sort of thinking, and they will just believe what has been taught to them at a very early age. They may well believe that there is a God. I very much doubt that if you stopped people in the street, they would be able to tell you what it is they believe in, despite their indoctrination. And let's face it, religion was taught on a rote basis some years ago. I, I very much doubt that people would be able to, to explain their religious beliefs. So I don't think that indoctrination is as thorough as you suggest it might be. Well, maybe not in all schools, but certainly in the schools that I went to, uh, I, on many occasions... Well, of course, there's a, there's, there's a $50,000 question now, isn't there, Daniel? The indoctrination that you suffered has caused you to think it out. Why are you suggesting that your peers aren't able to do so? Well, in my experience, the majority of the people I went to school with still hold those religious views, and from what I've gathered by talking to them, they hadn't really thought about them properly. I don't really, really follow... I, I understand that. What I don't understand is why you think that is harmful. Because the teaching of a religion, and I'm talking about virtually any religion, there are some obscure ones which this statement doesn't apply to, but the majority of religions, certainly the ones that are taught in schools, be they Christian, be they Muslim, or what have you, the what they're teaching you is a pattern for a good life. I nearly said a good Christian life, which of course wouldn't be true in the Muslim case, but for a good life. A Christian with a small c, if you like. Responsibility and respect for one's fellow human. And surely that's no bad thing, whatever the motivation. I don't think you really need to teach a well, let, well, let it, morality. I'm not it's suggesting. Morality on its own. I'm not suggesting that you do need to teach religion in order to introduce morality, but if you can peg it all on one name and give a child, give a baby even, a thought process that says, "Well, God says this, and therefore it is right because God is all powerful." Whilst that isn't, in my view, a very good ag academic exercise, it is a first-class way of instilling in the child's mind the process of respecting his or her fellow being. And if at a later date they re-examine that in an academic way and come to the conclusion that the reason is wrong, but the process is right, then surely it doesn't matter. Whereas, on the other hand, if you didn't teach them that, and they didn't have the academic ability to examine why they are on this globe, then maybe they will not have any acceptable process of distinguishing between good and evil. Well, first of all, I don't think religion corners the market on morality. I'm not suggesting religion does corner the market, but it has got a big chunk of it. And um, so many religious, uh, what, what, so many churches have their well, such a lot of twaddle along with them. Like well, of course the they have a lot of... people infallibility. Do you think that they... should be taught in schools? Fine, they have a lot of twaddle, but it comes with the territory, doesn't it? If you buy a pound of apples, you buy a pound of apple cores, or you certainly buy some, and they're not much use to you, unless you're an idiot like me and eat the bloody things. But that is the truth of it. It comes together with all this ritual, and the ritual, let's be fair, is the bit that majority of people reject. How many people were brought up in the Roman Catholic faith that actually now go to Mass? A minimum number. How many people brought up in the Anglican faith still go to Mass? Or, or to whatever their, their service is called, go to church regularly? It's a tiny proportion. That's why but they're why kicking up stink. state money teaching that sort of nonsense? Because that comes with the territory. What you're actually teaching is a code of conduct for the future, and I can't see anything wrong with that. And if, as a result of those teachings, you end up giving somebody, quote, a whole load of twaddle, then it doesn't matter, because those who have the discernibility in my view, to later examine themselves and say, well, look, it really does, you know, I mean, it is a lot of twaddle, when you, you know, a couple of slices, a loaf and a glass of wine, and you're anybody's. I mean, it's crazy. But if it gives you a satisfactory way of living on this planet with your fellow man without doing him harm, then it was worth it. It's a small price to pay a bit of twaddle. 
Well, I think our objective should always be to improve the educational system, and one way of improving it will be to get rid of the twaddle. But would it? If you got rid of the twaddle, would you still have the peg to hang on the good life, as it were? Well, if you bring children up to believe that they shouldn't hit somebody else because God will get angry and punish them, I think when they grow up and realise that God isn't going to send a thunderbolt down from heaven, they're more likely to go out and hit somebody than if you teach them. If that theory was correct, if, if that theory was correct, we would have a lot of lawbreakers in our society. Well, we uh, well, yes, we do, but we always have had. We would have considerably more than we've got now. The majority of people in our society, despite the ever-growing crime statistics, do not commit crimes. And that majority have their reasons. The reasons are they believe it to be wrong. It isn't just fear. They believe it to be wrong. I don't believe that's got anything to do with the religious education. That Fine, think. that's what you think. OK, Daniel? Goodbye. Cheers. How do, Michael? Uh, hello, Alan. Yeah. What did you think of Southport tonight? I thought Southport was great tonight, just like I think it's great every night. Hello... I've forgotten. Bal. Mal. How do, Mal? Not there anyway. We'll go to line three and Lee after the break. He's at it again. Constantly striving to stay one step ahead of the competition, John Wilding announces details of a campaign enabling you to buy any brand new Ford Fiesta on 4.9% finance. APR just 9.5. Right now you can choose any Fiesta model, including the economical 950 and 1100 popular, the Gear High Performance XR2 and the latest 1.4S, all on 4.9% finance, an incredibly low APR of just 9.5. Con Contact John Wilding of Garstang now and test drive your new Fiesta. Frames Travel Late Availability Update. Special up to the minute computerized late availability holidays from Frames Travel. Like Sunstart Holidays new Sun Savers. Early season holidays at last minute prices. Costa Brava from £98. Mallorca from £105. Benidorm from £108. Hurry to the late availability experts. Frames Travel in Chorley, Leyland, Lancaster, Preston and Wigan. New Sun Savers at last minute prices. Ibiza from £108. Corfu from £135. How do Lee? But he's not with us anymore. How do Mark? Hello, Alan. I'd like to say I think, you, I think your programme's brilliant, but I wish you... Thank you very much. How do Richard? Good evening, Mr Bezik. Now for some dangerous radio. I am Sir Richard Alan Bezik, and on my left is my beautiful partner, Lady Adrian Alan Bezik. Ah! I have nothing in my trousers. Smart as out. Well, that's true. There's not that much between your ears. How do to line six, who's called Rodney. Hello, Alan. Yes. There was an old lady mugged down our way the other day, and she was just left on the floor, dying. Now, I would have finished that off myself, the owl bag. Not a... How do, Mike? How do, Alan? Um, I'd like to complain about the... St uh, Bring me back when you know what you want to complain about. Hello, Carl. I'd like to, I do. I'd like to talk about um, Hampton Court burning down. I'd like the taxpayer having to foot the bill. I mean, like, it's just there. Uh, I think it's wrong that we should have to foot the bill. What do you suggest we do? Leave it burnt down? Yeah. Fine. Yeah. I think we should leave it burned down. And we should also burn Old Trafford down. Well, we might well do just that. I'll make it be burnt. I'll do... Martin. Hello, Alan. I reckon that everybody coming into this country, immigrants no matter where they're from, should abide by our laws. We shouldn't make laws to suit them. If we have to wear motorcycle helmets, so should they. If we have to slaughter animals in a certain way, so should they. We shouldn't make rules for them. They live by We're our not laws. making rules for them. We have rules, in the case of motorcycle, for the protection of individuals. And I presume you're w referring to the Sikh and his turban. Well, the turban... No, no, I'm referring to anybody that comes into this country. Well, you picked a particular example. Now, the example you picked stands out a mile. Now, if you'd like to retract that example, fine. Well, 
Do you retract the example or no, don't you? No, I, I, that's just an example. I'm yes, I know it's an example. I'm One wonders why you shied away from it. Everybody, no matter where they're well, from. Well, the laws do apply to everybody, but also within all law... No. Within the majority of law, there is room for manoeuvre. There is the power of the government to actually make amendments to laws to accommodate facilities for individual groups. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean groups of immigrants, although the fascist press obviously choose the groups of immigrant peoples to have their go at because the fascist press have got nothing better to do. So... What you're saying is that people coming into this country, if they have laws in their country that they think are right, they should be... this law should be flexible enough to change it. I believe that the law of Britain should protect the people that reside within the shores of Britain. So you think... I believe that the law of Britain should be a humanitarian law, and I believe it should not be some kind of diktat actually prescribed by, well, what can only be described as a Christian order. But I, I still think that the law should be rigid. It the law should be rigid. It applies I to see. every man. Are you one of those people that drives at 30 mile an hour, never 31? If you answer yes to that, I will call you a liar. Well... When you say the law should be rigid, do you mean that there should not even be courts to make decisions about law? You see, the problem with rigid law is it has to be written in words. And words are not rigid. But, what but you perhaps don't understand that. What I'm thinking about is, really, this bloke that was over a few weeks ago... Excuse me a moment, Martin. When I tried to put an example to you, you said, I don't want to talk about specifics. Now you do. However, you've changed your mind. Go on, talk about your specific, Martin. This bloke that was over um, a month ago, was it? Had a 12-year-old... You're old telling me, Martin, there really is little point... Year old, a 13-year-old bride yes. went against all our laws... Indeed. ...morals, beliefs, everything Indeed. else. And yet there were still people trying to say that it was right... That well, Martin, that first... That, that, Martin, Martin, yeah. people's opinion isn't important. What is important in discussions about the law is what the law said. And it was quite categoric in that case, and the categoric statement was thus. If that man had intercourse with that girl, he would, in this country, be breaking the law. So you have no complaint in that issue. It's irrelevant, Martin. Are you suggesting that the law should be able to control people's opinions, too? No, no. Well, you are, Martin. You are actually... Well, Martin, you came on and said the law should be rigid. Fine, it should be rigid. But do you believe that people should not be allowed to have an opinion that it might well be wrong? The law does... Do you believe that, Martin? No. 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 So you believe that the law should leave people to make up their own mind, providing they obey the law whilst doing so and after doing so? No, well, those... the law is the law. The law should be... Excuse me, would you like to listen to the question, Martin? It is either you're deaf or unable to understand the English language. Let us find out which it is. I shall speak slowly to enhance your ability to hear it. Well, your ability to understand it will have been the job of your teacher. We shall find out whether he or she succeeded. I'll ask you the question again. Do you believe that the law should be rigid and should allow people to make their own opinions about whether it is right or or wrong that law whilst they do it and after they have done it they honour the law yes there yes. you see you needn't have argued because once you understood the question it was a lot more simple for you really yes Good. and that's how it has to be for you martin yes. simple hello tom hello what do you want john all john. right john i phoned up about the the policeman in Southport, the one that was supposed to be, uh, murdered the fellow, the 50 year old, old year old. There fella. has not yet been a charge of murder. No, well. No, well, go by. Go by. We don't talk about murder when there's no charge of murder. How do Graham? You know, sir? How do Colin? Oh, Alan. Uh, it's about the cricket in the West Indies going at the moment. I think the rules should be changed so that 
maybe England can last the five days out or something. Because it's just not cricket at the moment, is it? Well, I, we could change it in what way? Make the West Indies wear blindfolds? Um, well, no. All of them must have one of their arms amputated? Well, that's a bit extreme, isn't it? Well, extreme, like, but it, it, it might need some... players or uh, maybe giving them one head start or something like that. How many start? Um, so, 100, say. We may go up to about 250, then. Well, we might, but I shouldn't bank on it. That, well, will just, um, that will just incite the West Indies to play their best game. Yeah, but maybe let them only have about five or six players then, and maybe Perhaps. let them all be spin bowls or something. Let us face it, if, if they put <laughs> Viv Richards and Gordon Greenwich out there, we'd have a job anyway. Yeah, well, well say let them back with one arm or something like that then. Cause well, yeah, back with one arm. We're, just... not, we're not going to get any of them out, so... We'll no, we don't. Have a chance I mean, the well, well, that's the only way we'd get anywhere if we change the rules. We'll never beat them at the game. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not, it's not right, is it? Because even their fans aren't coming to watch them because it's too easy. Quite. So we'll have to Perhaps them. that's something they ought to examine. They're all even there laughing at us because they're not bothered, are they? <laughs> well, it would seem not. Well, it's not. <laughs> never they? mind. And they're making all the stories about both of them as well. It's not on, is it? Well, uh, I don't think it's the West Indies that are making up the stories about both of them. I think it's the fascist press. <laughs> well, it's got to be changed, though, hasn't it? You've got to agree with me there. No, I don't agree with you. I quite like the idea of Britain getting stuffed by you, the West you like Indies. You like seeing England get beat at cricket, do you? I like to see the West Indies do their stuff, and if that means that they've got to do it against England, and inevitably means that England will get stuffed, then so be it. I'm interested in cricket. I'm not interested in England's cricket. So when England play other teams, you're not bothered who wins? Not really, no. I'm more interested in the game. Well, that's not a very good attitude, is it? You're supposed to be in... An English supporting person? No, I'm not. Why not? I've never claimed to be. Well, you should be, from England, well, don't you? Use, you say I should be. I don't think I should be. I'm interested in the game. I go to watch a game of cricket, not watch a group of people win or lose. Yeah, but you, you can't watch cricket without supporting your own team. You've got to well, I don't have a team. <laughs> you've got to have a team. You, you I haven't got to have a team. It's like watching anything. You've got to, you've got to support one of the teams. You can't. No, I haven't. Why not? Because I've, I have no interest in the result. I'm interested in the game. Yeah, but it's not a game, is it? It's just one-sided. Well, OK, I'll accept that England offer very little resistance, but you're still watching great skill at work. Well, yeah, from one side you are. You well, not from one side, you watch it from wherever you're thing. sat, and you see both sides if you look about you. It's just one of the sides is crap. <laughs> you're not doing anything, are they? They're either, they're either letting the ball into the wicket, so... Or, or the <laughs> head. Yeah, all the head, yeah. <laughs> or, the, or other parts of their gender. <laughs> Hey, Paul Little Gatton, he's one of the best players. He keeps getting hit all the time, doesn't he? Who is? Paul Little Gatton. Okay, Paul Little Gatton doing Gattin. his batting. Poor Little Gatton is built like an outside shit house. Yeah, but he's only small, isn't he? About five foot ten. Or he's something. five foot ten, but he's built like a bloody gorilla. <laughs> yeah, but Poor Little Gatton, if he hears you say that, he'll eat your head. He won't. <laughs> anyway, interesting talking right, to you, even though you're a prat. <laughs> How do line five, Bernard? Oh. What? I'd like to talk about darts and why you don't think it's a sport. Well, talk about it. And why do, why well, you that's don't a question. I thought you were going to talk about it. Well, why, why is it that the minority of people don't think it's a sport? The minority of people? Yeah. Well, I've no well, idea. I can only speak for me, and I think it's crap. Why? Because it's played by big, fat, ugly... Oh, over come on. It is played... You know Do you know what preparation you have to put into that? I don't give a monkey's toss what eight preparation... Hours a day. I don't care what you have to put in. I have to do eight hours a day for this programme. But it doesn't make it a sport. Dustbin men, put in eight, dustbin men put in eight hours a day. It doesn't make it a sport. It's very mentally hard. Very then, mentally hard. Could you go to the board and practice for eight hours a day? The answer is no. See? But there are other things I could do for eight hours I'm a day good. that aren't called sport. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Right. Just because to be good at it you have to practice a lot doesn't yeah. mean it's a sport. That isn't the definition of a sport. It's a hobby. It's a very, very lucrative well, what do business. What you call a sport? I call a sport, or my definition of sport, oh, is a communal... A communal activity of athletes. Athletes? You don't call football a sport? Yes, footballers are athletes. Football a sport. Yes, I'm prepared to call football a sport. You have to train for I don't, daughters, don't you? 
You said that. I said athletes. You have to train oh, you to have be to a go jogging around playing, be an you, athlete. You have to train to be a computer programmer, but you don't see computer programming in the Olympic Games. You have to train to be a doctor, but they don't cut legs off for the Olympic Games. You have to train for all sorts of things. You even have to train a dog. And somebody sometimes trains a monkey. On this occasion, Bernard, they failed. The monkey stays stupid. Goodbye. Hello, Gail. No, I don't know what it is about your telephone, Gail, but it's crap. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Can I talk about Sunday trading hours, please? Yes. Well, if the law comes through, my boss has said to me that he's going to write out new contracts for all the employees. If they don't sign them within 12 weeks, he's going to uh, get rid of the people who haven't signed them. And I was just wondering if that's legal. How long have you worked there? Uh, eight months. Then it's legal. Oh. Not very fair, though, is it? You didn't ask whether it was fair. Well, it's not very fair for that side of society. Well, goes. fair. I'm not interested in fair. The question is, is it legal? The job of the law is not to be fair, otherwise it couldn't function. Because there is always a party that has to lose any dispute. And, of course, as long as there's a loser, that loser will believe it's unfair. I'll do to nobody, because we're having a break. OMC. The place to be for unbeatable deals on the new Fiesta range is OMC Ford Chorley. You've got till April 30th to grab finance at 4.9%, APR an amazing 9.5, that's low. And right now there's £3,000 worth of leisure bonds absolutely free with any new Ford or selected used cars. And we'll beat any advertised deal on old model Escorts and Orions. If you don't choose us, you're paying too much. OMC Ford! Bolton Street Chorley. The Red Rose Radio Great North Western Half Marathon and Four and a Half Mile Fun Run will take place on Sunday the 8th of June. Both runs are sponsored by Bell Cuisine and will raise money for the Heartbeat Appeal. A commemorative medal will be awarded to all the finishers. For an entry and sponsorship form, forward a stamped addressed envelope to the Heartbeat Headquarters, 17A Friargate Preston, PR1 2AU or collect the forms from Red Rose Radio Reception. I promised to say hello to a few people this evening when I was at the Scaresbury Arms in Southport and one person I have got to say hello to because he was footing the bill for me, in other words he was giving me a pocket full of money and that is John who was the representative from Youngers and was there I suppose playing his harp <laughs> that's how he was flogging it he said to me, he said when you got on the stage you got to mention Art Lager three times so I got on and I said Art Lager's crap Art Lager <laughs> wasn't overly pleased, but then I can say things like that because I don't use any of the other lagers either. Indeed, I don't use any alcohol at all, but never mind. I'm sure if you like lager, harps as good as any other. John of Youngers and Karen, the delightful Karen, who's Mrs. John, or Mrs. Younger, perhaps. Who knows? You don't know how I the company he was. I'll do to you anyway. I also promised to say I'll do to Wayne and Steve and to two very beautiful young ladies who followed me out to my car and then asked me to take them on to somewhere else because they didn't want to go back into the Scaresbrick, but I noticed they did do, and that was Kim and Maxine. By Jove. And when you ask me, am I married? And the answer is yes. And perhaps some would say more's the pity, but not I, because I'm glad. Kim and Maxine, I'll do to you. Back to the lines to talk to Paul. All right, Alan. Yes, I am. Yeah, well, I was in the pub tonight. I was just standing there by the bar, and these three pieces of string walked in.